It's good to see all of you tonight. If you have your Bibles, you can turn to 1 John. We'll be popping to different places, but we'll mostly be staying in the writings of John tonight. Uh, we have a lot of young people with us and a lot of visitors, and we're thankful for you for being here with us. Um, one time when I was 16 years old, I drove up to Gardendale um, with Sarah and Ruth McKee and Allie Gibson, and we got in the car and we drove from Prattville, and we came here to Gardendale just to see some friends. And I remember we all were about to go out to eat after, and Annette McKee stopped me and said, do y'all want to come over to my house for a pint? And I was like, I wasn't sure because I didn't really know who Miss Annette was at the time, but I think she knew who I was. But she invited us all to come over and eat pie. Well, I was like, I, I, I'm not sure. I don't know what the plans are, but I know we're going to Zaxby's. And I specifically remember sitting at Zaxby's and telling the group that this lady <laughs> invited us to come have pie. And Trent Ferris said, was it Annette McKee? And I said, oh, yes. And he goes, you told Annette McKee no? <laughs> he told us to get in the car and we were going to Annette McKee's house to have pie. And we did, probably about 15 or 17 of us. Uh, and we had a good time. So I'm too and thankful for Annette McKee's work in the kingdom. And I had that special memory. And if I ever have any reason to go to Prattville, which I don't know why I would, but if I did, Annette, I'm expecting some pie when I come visit. Um, so, so thankful for her work. And we're sad to, to lose her in this way, but she'll be beneficial wherever she goes. What I'd like to do with the time I have with you tonight is just talk about these two words, friends and fellowship. But what I want to do is I want to build our own definitions of those two words, mainly using John's writings. And instead of going to Webster's or going to the internet and just Googling what these words mean, I really want John to define these two words for us. And so that's what we'll do. If you look at 1 John chapter 1, he begins talking about fellowship. And we'll go all the way to 3 John in the last verse of 3 John when he talks about friendship. So we begin in fellowship and John ends his writings in friendship. So let's do that together um, and hopefully we'll pull something helpful from this. Let's first talk about that word fellowship, which we see in 1 John 1, 1 through 4. Look at verse 1 here. He says, that which we heard from the beginning, which we have heard, we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled concerning the word of life. The life was manifested, and we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life, which was with the Father and was manifested to us. That which, when we have seen and heard, we declare to you that you may have fellowship with us. And truly, our fellowship is with the Father and his Son, Jesus Christ. And these things we write to you that your joy may be full. And obviously, I'm really focusing there on verse 3. He talks about how we've declared these things to you, that we were with Jesus. We have seen him. We have heard him. We have touched him. We told you about him. And we know that we have fellowship with him. And so the way I want to kind of visualize this is you can think of this almost just my little circle here. And what I have written in the middle of the circle is the fellowship of Jesus Christ. And I get that phrase from 1 Corinthians 1.9. 1 Corinthians 1.9, Paul says, God has called to you to be part of the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ. So the thought is here is that God called you out and he, how you have accepted the invitation and you are part of the fellowship of Jesus Christ. And I think that it was obviously the same fellowship that John's talking about here. Who can we put in this circle that's part of the fellowship of Jesus Christ? We'll look at verse 3. The first one is, is that which we have seen and heard we declare to you that you may be in fellowship with us. The people who declared the message of Jesus originally, the people who were witnesses of Jesus and spread his message, they obviously here in verse three are part of the fellowship of Jesus Christ. So I put John, Peter, James, Thomas, Paul, Philip, and we can name off all the apostles, right? That's who that us is there those that declared the message of Jesus Christ, the witnesses of Jesus Christ. Who else is in fellowship of the fellowship of Jesus Christ? Look at the second half of verse three. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and his son, Jesus Christ. They too are part of the fellowship of Jesus Christ. Now notice here, the fellowship here, we are calling the fellowship of Jesus Christ. 
But is Jesus in the fellowship of Jesus Christ? Yes, he is, right? And, and that works well if you don't understand that. Give it a moment, and we'll get there in, in just a moment about why that works. But these people are all in the fellowship of Jesus Christ. Now look at verse 7. Verse 7 says, But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ his Son cleanses us from all sin. Who else can we put in our circle here that's a part of the fellowship of Jesus Christ? Well, we can put all people that walk in the light and have been cleansed by the blood of Jesus. They too are part of the fellowship of Jesus Christ. And that works really well with 1 Corinthians 1.9, that God has called saints to come be a part of the fellowship of Jesus Christ. So there's a lot of people here and really a lot of great people in here that are part of this fellowship. But again, what does the word fellowship mean? Now that we have this thought, let me take you to another time that word fellowship is used, but it's not used in a spiritual connotation. And that's in Luke 5. Turn to Luke 5. You may want to keep a marker in 1 John. But Luke 5 shows us that word fellowship again, used in a different context. And it helps us build that definition. The word here in the New King James, what I'm reading, is partnership, but it's the same Greek word fellowship. It's just used in the masculine sense because all men are a part of this particular fellowship. In Luke 5, I'm going to start verse 9. It says, For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish which they had taken. And so also were James and John and the sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. That word partners right there, that's our fellowship word. And Jesus tells us, Simon, do not be afraid. So it says here that they were amazed with the catch of fish they had just caught. And James and John and Simon were all in fellowship together. James, John, Peter, I can put them all in the same little partnership bubble right here, right? They're in a fellowship. But here in verse 10, is he talking about the fellowship of Jesus Christ? What kind of fellowship is he talking about here in Luke 5? Y'all, he's talking about a fishing fellowship. They are partners together in a fishing business. And so the writer says they're in a fellowship together. Now, I know some of y'all men are like, oh, I wish I could be in that fellowship. That's not the point. The point is, is that they are partners together for a common cause. So we have actually the same men over here, but this context, they're in the fellowship of Jesus Christ. But here they are in another context, being in the fellowship of this fishing business they run together. And both of these are the correct ways of biblically using this word fellowship. So this is the definition I draw from these two accounts. This is my definition, that fellowship is partnership for a common cause. That's what fellowship means. It's not just that we're in a room together. It's not just that we have some types of agreement together. It's that we are together in a common cause. So how is Jesus in the fellowship of Jesus? It's because Jesus is another partner in the common cause of the gospel, Jesus Christ, the kingdom. We have a mission, we have an objective, and Jesus and the apostles and all Christians everywhere are going to work together for that same objective. And that's why we're in the fellowship of Jesus Christ. Partnership for a common cause. Could we use this word in other scenarios and it be correct? You know, do not lawyers, you know, call their companies fellowships? You know, what's the thought? They work together for a common cause. We could use this word correctly. We just usually don't in modern day language because we've changed the meaning of the word to mean morally like friendship. But really the word is used for this. Could we, some of us as individuals, start some club for some objective and we could call that rightfully a fellowship? A lot of us here love Star Wars. And I know I jumped to Star Wars because it's my safe place. But a lot of us love that story, right? And we like talking about the movies and we like talking about the books and we like talking about how we don't like the new movies. You know, if we get together, we can say, hey, we want to go around and we want to teach people about Star Wars. And we could have a little club and we could work together on that. Could we call that a fellowship? 
Yes, we could. And Grayson Barrett would be the president. Now, is that a fellowship? Yes, it is a fellowship. It's a partnership for a common cause. But is it the fellowship of Jesus Christ? No, it's not. Because the fellowship of Jesus Christ is for the cause of Jesus Christ. So our cause here is important. Don't use the word fellowship unless you have a cause. Because that's what the word is appropriately used for. Now, nine times out of ten in the Bible, when he says the word fellowship or the word communion, which is the same Greek word, he's talking mostly about the cause of Jesus Christ. However, there's other places like Luke 5 when he talks about it to use fishing, and there's another time when he talks about it to have fellowship with demons, about having fellowship with something evil. But there's always a common cause attached to this word. And I think that's a strong definition that we get from the Scriptures. Let's also look at this concept. Look at verse 6 with me of 1 John. Hopefully you kept your marker there. 1 John 1, 6, John says, If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. So if you say you have fellowship with Jesus, but you don't walk in light, you walk in darkness, well, then what are you? You're a liar. Because you say you have fellowship with Jesus, but your walk and your actions say otherwise. Look also in chapter 2, verse 3. Chapter 2, verse 3, same book. John says, Now by this we know that we know him, if we keep his commandments, if we keep his commandments. He who says I know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. By this we know that we are in him. If he says he abides in him, ought himself also to walk just as he walked, right? You know, here's me and all of us that are of age of accountability. We've all been in this spot right here. We've been out of the fellowship of Jesus Christ. We weren't in the fellowship of Jesus Christ, but what happened? Chapter 1, verse 7 happened. We were cleansed by the blood of Jesus. And when we were cleansed by the blood of Jesus and we began to walk in the light, what happened? Jesus added us to his fellowship, and we were part of the common cause of Jesus Christ. Now, is that a permanent fixture according to these passages? These passages say, however, if you've got someone who does not walk as Jesus walked, and someone who maybe talks the talk, but he doesn't walk the walk that Jesus expects him to walk, well, then that person is a liar. He is not in the fellowship of Jesus Christ. How was he added and removed from this fellowship? Was it not because of his spiritual actions, the way that he walked, the way that he conducted himself? He did something to rebel against God, therefore he was not in the fellowship, or he did something for the cause of God and he was in the fellowship? There's a thought here telling us about how we enter and how we exit this fellowship. And let me bring up this point. Fellowship is defined by a spiritual location, not a physical location. And I think this right here is where we get the most confused. You know, the singing's very good tonight. The building's full. You know, if someone got up here and said, wow, we're having a whole lot of fellowship right now with you guys, does that statement work? Talking about the fellowship of Jesus Christ? No. No. All of us had the same amount of fellowship before we entered this building. Because if you were walking the walk and you were behaving the way a disciple of Christ should behave, were you in fellowship with Jesus Christ? Yes, you were. When you entered the building, had anything changed? No. Now, if I go out there and I completely sin and rebel against God, am I out of the fellowship of Jesus Christ? Yes, that can affect my fellowship with Jesus Christ, but it's not me being in some kind of physical location to you. And let me think about this one with you. Are we all in this building together right now? Yeah, no duh, of course. But are all of us in this building right now in fellowship with Jesus Christ? We all know for truth that's not the case. Even though all of us are in this building, not all of us are in fellowship with Jesus Christ, and I would like for that to change. So fellowship is not about physical location. 
It is about spiritual location. And that's how you enter and exit the fellowship of Jesus Christ. It has nothing to do with being together. It has everything to do with being in partnership for a common cause. And that's seven days a week, 24-7. Let's go to friends. I think we've covered fellowship pretty well. Go to the last thing that John wrote for us here in his epistles. Third John in the very last section, verse 13. This is the only time John in his epistles that he uses this word, friends. Verse 13, John says, I have many things to write, but I do not wish to write to you with pen and ink, but I hope to see you shortly, that we may speak face to face. Peace to you. Our friends greet you. Greet the friends by name. And that's the only time we've got friends in his epistles. We're going to have it more in his gospels, but here just in his epistles. The commandment here that John gives to his audience or the few people that he wrote to here, to Gaius, you know, he tells them, look, the friends are coming to you, the people I'm sending to you, I want you to greet them. And I don't want you just to greet them. I want to greet, you, greet them by name, that they know your name, Gaius, And you're going to know their name, Gaius. And when you greet each other, I want you to greet each other by name because that's how close you should be. Greet the friends by name. Is this the same word as fellowship? Let me propose to you as we move forward that friendship and fellowship is not the same thing. Because I can greet all my friends by name, but I cannot greet everyone in the fellowship by name. And let's go back to our diagram to help. Strong's uses this definition, and it's what we're, where we're getting, and I think it's correct. A friend is he who associates familiarly with one, a companion. That word familiar there, that I'm familiar with you, you're familiar with me, and that's what actually makes us friends. And I think that's the way the Bible uses that same word. Think about it again logically. Here's my fellowship of Jesus Christ. Am I friends with everyone in the fellowship of Jesus Christ? You know, that would be a nice thought. And maybe that's something that'll be a reality in heaven. But am I friends with everyone in the fellowship of Jesus Christ? Here's my friends in my little diagram, and I promise you this is not to scale. But even though I am a very popular person, If this is everyone that's ever been in the fellowship of Jesus Christ, how many of them are actually going to be called my friends right now? Just a small portion, right? And not only this, if we look at all of Andrew's friends, many of them are in the fellowship of Jesus Christ, but guess what? There's some of them that are not in the fellowship of Jesus Christ, and I try to appeal to them about coming into the fellowship, but we all here have associations with people that we care about that are not part of the fellowship of Jesus Christ. So just right off the bat here, is my friends and my fellowship of Jesus Christ here, are they the same thing? They can't be. Now, what about these people? What about the apostles? Are they in the fellowship of Jesus Christ? Yep, John just said they were in 1 John 1. But am I friends with the apostles? You know, I think I have a good idea about Paul. And I think we have a good idea about Peter. And I think we can say confidently that we really have a good idea and know about what they are about. But does Paul and Peter know who Andrew is? I don't think Paul or Peter have any reason to know who Andrew is right now. Now, maybe in paradise, that's going to be a different story. But right now, do I have any reason to believe that they know who I am? I have no reason to believe that. If Peter walked in this building right now, would any of y'all know that it was Peter? Y'all don't even know what he looks like. And neither do I. Are we going to be able to greet him by name? No, we're not. Let me propose again. I might know who the apostles are, like I can name them, but they don't know who I am. I'm in fellowship with them in Jesus Christ, but they are not my friends. And that's okay. There's no way for us to have that familiar association. Uh, What about the prophets? Are they in the fellowship of Jesus Christ? Yeah, they were working for that cause. But are they my friends? I am not friends with any prophets. Now, I'm friends with people who believe they're prophets, but they're liars. You know, 
I'm not friends with the prophets, but I am partners with them for the common cause of Jesus Christ. What about this? What about brethren in foreign places? Now, there's brethren that live in other places that I'm friends with that I've gotten to know through other people or maybe visiting and that sort of thing. But am I friends with all Christians everywhere here on this earth? No, I am not. Are there not brethren in India right now that are worshiping and working for the same God that I am, but I have no idea who they are and they have no idea who I am? Of course. And that's the way it's going to have to be. But am I in fellowship with those people? You bet I'm in fellowship with those people because we're working together for that common cause. Now, here's a huge one. What about the dead in Christ? Do they have fellowship with Jesus Christ? Yes, they do. They're still part of that common cause. I'm partners with them. But are all of them my friends? There's a few that have passed on that were my friends. And I've got them in a little bit room here in my circle. But most of them are not my friends. I don't know them. They don't know me. But we're partners in Jesus Christ. And at least in my mind, that helps me try to understand the way this word friendship is used, where it's not the same as fellowship, although many of my friends can be and really should be part of the fellowship of Jesus Christ. John only uses this word one time here. And then let me pull an application from this verse 13 and verse 14. 14, John says, peace to you, our friends greet you, greet the friends by name. Can I not put this circle in here? What about brethren I can know? Brethren that I have the opportunity to know, should they be my friends? Should I be able to greet them by name? I think that's what John's getting at here, is that there are brethren that you should know. There are brethren that you have the opportunity to know, and you should be striving to be able to greet them by name. And let me take a moment here just to make an application. I know that the several past couple of months, we've been able very thankfully to identify with a whole lot of new people. And and let's be straight, none of us could be more grateful for that. You know, we know about groups where they're losing people. It's, It's grateful and thankful to the Lord that we can say we've been adding people. And we're excited about that. But is that difficult to try to learn everybody's names? You know, some of y'all, this is the largest congregation you've ever been a part of. And I've had new brethren that have identified with us come to me and say, Andrew, I'm worried. This is a big group. I don't know everybody's name. I don't know how I'm going to know everybody's name. Well, let me tell you this. It is possible to learn everyone's name here in this building. It took me about two and a half years. But I think I got a pretty good general idea of what people's names are. But did I have to work at it? Did I have to ask? Did I have to go up to people and say, hey, can you tell me your name one more time? Yes, I had to do all of those things. But what can I confidently say if I'm striving for that? That I am greeting the friends by name. And I think that's what John's application is that we can pull from this. Now, before we move on to that thought, Are there going to be people sometimes that you've been worshiping with for 10, 5 years and you still haven't learned their name yet? Yeah, that's a real life scenario. How are you going to be able to reconcile that? I know that you could go to the backboard and kind of try to cheat and like, okay, let me find their face and I'm going to get their name and I'm going to pretend like I've always known it. But, But I heard Mark Copeland say this and I thought it was golden. He said the best thing to do It's just to go up to people, even if you haven't known their name for 10 years and had the opportunity. It's just to go up to them and say, I'm sorry, I want to know your name, but I don't know it. Will you tell me your name? And they tell you, yes, my name is Andrew. And and why is that just a better thing to do? Because you just went up and told them, even though I don't know you like I should, I want to. You're worth knowing your name. And sometimes we have to be humble And that's the very thing we have to do. Hey, I do not know your name. Will you tell me yours? And I'll tell you mine. And then we can greet the brethren by name. We can greet the friends by name. And there's our word friendship there. 
The reason why I think John saved the word friendship is because it's such a special word in his gospel. Before we read these passages in John, let's bring out that final definition. And this is my definition for friendship. Friends know each other, at least at the bare minimum. They have this familiar association and they know you and you know me and that's why we can call ourselves friends. That's why you can greet the friends by name. Friends have to know each other. So let me look at these passages quickly in John, the Gospel of John, and he uses that word friendship a lot. And let me look at those passages. This is what John the Baptist said about Jesus in John 3. John the Baptist says, He who has the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is fulfilled. John the Baptist says, I'm not the groom, but I am the best man. (laughs) He says, I am the friend of the bridegroom. Did John the Baptist and Jesus know each other? Yes, they did, right? And we even learn in Luke's account that they're family. And John the Baptist says, I'm the friend of the bridegroom, but I'm not the bridegroom himself. Does our definition hold up there that friends know each other? Yes, it does. What about this one in chapter 11? Talking about Lazarus. It says, these things he said, and after that, Jesus, he said to them, our friend Lazarus sleeps, but I go that I may wake him up. Does Lazarus and Jesus know each other? Yes, they know each other. And when he gets there and Lazarus is already dead, you know, his sisters are upset saying, you came too late when we called for you. Lazarus and Jesus know each other, so what does that make them? That makes them at the bare minimum friends. And that's why Jesus says, our friend Lazarus sleeps. Let me go wake him up. And maybe the most famous friends passage in John John 15, 13, Jesus says, Greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. For you are my friends if you do whatever I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends. For all things that I heard from my father, I have made known to you. So Jesus is about to die on the cross and his apostles are about to be scattered everywhere. And one of the last things he decides to tell them is, look, I'm about to lay down my life. But I need you to know that in my mind, I'm laying down my life for my friends. And he says, you know, I could have called you servants this whole time. I could have called you guys, you know, my slaves because you work for me. And I'm the boss. That's very obvious. But I don't want to call you servants. You know what I want to call you? I want to call you my friends. And that's what I've decided to call you. Does this definition hold up even with these passages? Friends know each other. I think that still holds up even with the words of Jesus. That Jesus was familiar with these people. Jesus knew these people. They knew him. And that's why they were friends. Now, before we move on to my last thought, look at verse 14 again. What does he tell the disciples? He says, you are my friends if you do whatever I command you. John runs with that statement all the way to what he's an old man and he writes his epistles. Let's go to 1 John 2, 3. 1 John 2, 3. In John 15, 14, Jesus said, you are my friends if you keep my commandments. Here's our fellowship of Jesus Christ. And we really hit home hard on the point that even though we have friends in the fellowship of Jesus Christ, the vast majority of the people in the fellowship of Jesus are not our friends because there's no way to know them. And that's how you become friends. You have to know each other. So where do I put Jesus on my bubble? Does Jesus not belong right here? What did we just read in 1514? We just read Jesus tell his disciples, you are my friends if you keep my commands. 
And as we went through all these things, you know, I said, you know, here's the apostles. Do we know them? Yeah, we have a pretty good idea about them, but do they know who we are? Probably not. But what about Jesus? Do, do I know who he is? I hope I do. I've even been promised that I can know him. Look at 1 John 2, verse 3. John says, now by this we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. John doesn't just say you can know him. He says you can know you know him. How? By keeping his commandments. If I keep Jesus' commandments, what do I get to confidently say? I get to confidently say I know him. Does Jesus know who I am? Verse 5, but whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. By this we know that we are in him. He who says he abides in him ought to walk just as he walked. If John's going to say we can abide in him, does Jesus know who we are? Y'all, Jesus knows the hairs on our head. Jesus knows everything about us. So if Jesus knows me and I know Jesus, what do I get to call him? I get to call him my friend. Could I call the apostles my friends? Not necessarily. Could I call the prophets my friends? Not necessarily. But the leader of this whole movement, do I get to call him my friend? Yes, I do. And I think that's a big deal. I think that's a very big deal. That's where Jesus belongs right there. He's one of our friends. So when we sing these songs about Jesus being my friend, what a friend we have in Jesus. Jesus, he is my friend. Is all these statements true? They should be. I can know him, he can know me, and we can be friends. And I think that's incredibly special. And hopefully it just simply, this will help us to find these two words. Jesus, this is where he belongs, but of course, he's a part of the fellowship of Jesus Christ. Thank you for your close attention. And hopefully this has helped us with those two little definitions, that fellowship is partnership for a common cause, and friendship is being familiar with each other, knowing each other, and that includes our relationship with Jesus Christ. You know, I, I think I've had pretty good friends uh, in this life. I think I've also had some bad friends. This is one in me. But mostly, you know, I, I think I've had a lot of good friends. And just like when I began telling that story with Annette, you know, those people were my friends. And I enjoyed being around them, and I think they enjoyed being around me. Why did we become friends? You know, usually it's because there was some care and kindness shown for each other. You know, typically when people hurt me or are rude to me, I'm not like, oh, I'm going to make this person my friend. Usually I'm like, i got to get this person out of my life as quickly as possible, right? But when people show general kindness and compassion and mercy, usually we become friends with those people. If that's the case, shouldn't the Lord be our greatest friend? You know, I, I think about my life. I, I'm in so much debt to him, I don't even know what to do. He's added me to this fellowship where I have a promise for eternal life. Well, number one, how am I even supposed to repay that? I can be guiltless in this life from the things I've done in my past. How can I possibly repay that? He's given me friends, and he's put people in my life that are good people that love him too. How could I repay him for that? No, he brought me to Gardendale Church of Christ and helped me meet you. How do I repay him for that? So who's my greatest friend? It's got to be the Lord Jesus Christ. And I think if we understand how much in debt we are to the possibilities of what he can do for us, it's easy to say this. Thank you, Lord. If there's anyone here that'd like to be in the fellowship of Jesus Christ, why don't you come forward as we stand and sing?